those watching and listening, thank you. And I hope that if it ministers to you, if it blesses you, that you just will share it um, with others. So today we're going to be in, we're going to be beginning chapter 3 of 1 Thessalonians. Chapter 3 of 1 Thessalonians. And the title of this message is Remedies for an Anxious Heart. Remedies for an Anxious Heart. Now, before a child can walk, he must learn to stand. Now, usually, the father and the mother will show the child, will teach the child to stand, and then, you know, slowly and progressively show them how to walk. Well, we know from the past chapter that Paul was a spiritual parent to these believers in Thessalonica, but he had been forced to leave that town, that city. How then could he help these young Christians learn to stand in the trials of life? Well, in the first two chapters, Paul explained how the church was born and nurtured. And so now he will deal with the next step of maturity, how the church was to stand. Now, the key word in this chapter is establish. And the key thought will be expressed in verse 8. For now we live if you stand firm in the Lord. Now, there's a couple things that I want you to be aware of, want you to know before we get started. Paul, again, saw himself as a spiritual father to this church, and when he left, and I'll explain a little bit more what's going on, but when he was gone, when he was separated from them and had been hindered, he was really concerned about this church. He was really concerned about the Thessala. Thessalonian believers, Thessalonian believers, some will say that he had an anxious heart. And so as we go through this passage I'm going to be, we're going to be looking at together, I'm also going to be sharing with you some remedies that we see through, uh, through what he wrote, some remedies for an anxious heart. All of us at one time or another, have felt anxiousness, have felt concern about what's going on, about our faith, about, you know, when we're going through trials. And, and so I'm going to be sharing some remedies that will help you out during those times. So before I get into God's Word, let's pray and ask the Lord to speak to us through His Word. Heavenly Father, I am so thankful that You have brought us all here together. I thank You for that time of worship. Lord, uh, we are humbled, yet we rejoice that You have chosen us, that You have picked us out, out of the world, to be Your children. Thank you for sending your son, Jesus, to die for us. Thank you for redeeming us. Thank you for, for all you've done. And so now, Lord, I just ask that you will bless this time as we get into your word, Lord. And I, will, I pray, Lord, that those who have been dealing with anxiousness, those who have been dealing with worry, Lord, that you will minister to them, that you will speak to them powerfully, mightily through your word here and through this message. Lord, there's a reason and purpose why you have everyone here and why you have uh, those people watching right now or listening to this message. I pray that your work will be done, that your will will be done and your purposes are fulfilled. So now, Lord, as we sit at your feet and hear your word, I pray that our hearts will soften. that our ears and minds will receive your word. 
Fill us now with your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 1. The Word of God says, Therefore, when we no longer can stand it, we thought it was better to be left alone in Athens. And we sent Timothy, our brother, and God's co-worker in the gospel of Christ to strengthen and encourage you concerning your faith so that no one will be shaken by these afflictions. For you yourselves know that we are appointed to this. In fact, when we were with you, we told you in advance that we were going to experience affliction. And as you know, it happened. For this reason, when I could no longer stand it, I also sent him to find out about your faith. Fearing that the tempter had tempted you, and our labor might be for nothing. But now Timothy has come to us from you and brought us good news about your faith and love. He reported that you always have good memories of us and that you long to see us as we also long to see you. Therefore, brothers and sisters, in all the distress and affliction, we were encouraged about you through your faith. Now, before I begin breaking down our passage here, uh, it's important to to inform you of what what Acts 17 tells us about what's going on here, about what had occurred up to this point that led Paul to write what we just read. When Paul and his companions left Thessalonica, they went to Berea and ministered the word there. But the plans that they intended to carry out were frustrated by troublemakers who had followed him from or followed them from Thessalonica and stirred up opposition against them. Afterwards, they made more than one attempt to return to Thessalonica, but they were blocked by uh, they were blocked from reaching their goal by Satan himself. So Paul left for Athens while Silas and Timothy remained at Berea. Now, from what it appears here in the first two verses of chapter 3, Timothy did eventually join Paul in Athens. But as we see here, Paul sent him back to Thessalonica. And he did this for three reasons. The first reason had to do with his deep concern. His deep concern he had for the saints there at Thessalonica. Back in chapter 2, verses 17 through 20, Paul had expressed his his intense passion to be reunited with the believers there in Thessalonica. Why did he have this intense passion because his confidence about their faith was part of his assurance in his own victorious faith on the last day. So when his efforts to return to them was hindered by Satan, his desire to reunite with them, it just grew more and more intense. That's why he begins... Or he uh, says in verse 1, when we can stand it no longer. Paul, see, he knew they were going through a hard time. And as their pastor, he just couldn't abandon them when they needed help. He couldn't just say, you know what, you guys figure it out. I've got business to take care of here at Berea and other places. Satan's keeping me from going there. You guys just figure it out. No, you couldn't just leave him alone. He cared for them. He loved them, had a deep concern for them. You see, as an evangelist, leading people to Christ was just one part of the commission God gave him. Now, there are gifts and there are callings of being an evangelist and 
that's great if the Lord has called you to do that. There are some great evangelists that have lived and are living, and they lead many people to Christ. But Paul was more than just an evangelist. That was just part of his calling. He was also called to be a pastor to the believers there by teaching and helping them become established in the faith. Now, just as a side note, there are a lot of churches out there that have great teachers, great communicators that know how to break down the Bible probably 10 times, 100 times better than me. They can communicate and are, can influence a lot better than me. But I can tell you this, there's not, not many of those people, pastors, teachers, not many of them are pastors. Not many of them have a heart for people and what's going on in their lives, what's happening with them. I hope and pray that as we grow as a church, that I will never lose that or I will never, I will never lose touch of that. The, the awesomeness, the greatness of just spending time with those that are here and to hear them out and to know what's going on in their lives and to minister to them. I've seen where there's a lot of big churches, even middle-sized mid -size and small churches where after the pastor teaches, you just don't see him anymore. He skips out and he leaves the ministering to his assistants or his, um, his volunteers. I think it's important. I think it's important that we have good pastors in the pulpit. Again, not, can not only teach, but will also lead, guide, establish, help establish people's faiths. As a pastor, Again, he taught them and he helped them become established in the faith. Now, this is, again, a good lesson for every Christian person, every Christian believer who labors for the Lord. For Paul, the Thessalonian believers were, he, he loved them so much, he cared for them so much that he was willing to risk his own life to return to them. And here's what else we find out in the letter to the Philippian church. He loved them also. He loved the church, the believers at Philippi, that he was willing to stay out of heaven in order to encourage them. He wanted to give of himself and his resources for them as a parent provides for his children or her children. You would give, sure, if you've been a parent or you are a parent, you would give it all up for your kids. You would be willing to go hungry. You would be willing to throw yourself in front of a bullet for your child. See, that's how Paul felt for his churches that he planted. He alluded to this in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 15, by saying, I will most gladly spend and be spent for you. Church, Christian, this here is a good remedy for fear and anxiety. To give of yourself, to think of others, 
to see, to talk to others and find out what's going on in their lives. And maybe by seeing the trials that other people are going through, the Lord will show you that yours is nothing. Yours is a little storm compared to their big storm. And in the process, the Lord will use them to minister to you. But even if your storm is a lot bigger and fiercer than theirs, you know what? He's using you. The Lord is using you also in those moments to minister to them. And as you do that, as you start seeing things or people or, or start looking at things outside of yourself, it's going to help you. It's going to help remedy those fears and anxieties you have. Now, we see also here that rather than waiting and doing nothing as he was being hindered by the devil, he ministered in Athens. And as he did that, or him and his companions, he sent the youngest member of his team. He sent Timothy, someone whom they were familiar with and who also had the same heart and passion as Paul. Now this leads us to the second reason Timothy was sent to Thessalonica to strengthen and encourage them concerning their faith. As, again, we know the Christians there had been persecuted because of their confession of Christ. So it was a critical time for them. It was, this was one of the most uh, craziest time in their young, uh, in that young church's existence. See, Satan has a tendency to sow doubt. And so it's possible that in the midst of their persecution, in their trials, he could have been dropping subtle suggestions that maybe it was a mistake to become a Christian. It would have been completely fascinating. It would have been, if I was there at Thessalonica, I would imagine it would be fascinating, so interesting to be there and to hear Timothy as he taught them and as he taught them to expect opposition, to bear it bravely, and also, more importantly, to rejoice in it. I wish I were there to hear for myself the words he shared to encourage them not to buckle, not to bend under the pressure of opposition. Reminding them, again, the words that Paul has shared with them, that we are appointed to this. <coughs> in verse 4, Paul there, again, reminds them that when he was with them in Thessalonica, he told them in advance that they were going to experience storms, trials, persecution. And sure enough, everything he said would happen, it happened. You ever spoken to your father and he's told you, hey, don't do this, don't do that, expect this, expect that? And you're like, yeah, no, nah, I'm good. I'm different. I'll figure it out. I'll be all right. Well, again, as a good father with experience, he passed this information, and sure enough, he was right. It happened. Friends, brothers and sisters in Christ, another good remedy for fear and anxiety is to really sit and listen and allow the preaching of God's Word to encourage you. 
come to church and let the problems that you have in your life fade away for an hour or however long I'm up here or the other pastors is up here. and Just allow the Spirit to minister to you, to encourage you. You've heard me say before that I believe there's always something that the Lord wants to speak to you, all of you personally, about. Whether it's the entire message or whether it's just one bullet point of my entire notes or one sentence in His Word, there's something there that He wants to speak to you personally about. And whatever it is, whatever it may be, that's why I encourage you to to have a pen on handy because it could be something that I say or have a highlighter available and highlight that passage that spoke to you, that encouraged you. And then allow it to, to just minister to you. Go When you go back home, dwell on it, chew on it. Ask the Lord to speak to you more concerning what it is that he was telling you or encouraged you about. Allow God's word to encourage you during trials, persecution, difficulties, the storms of life. My brothers and sisters in Christ, I also want you to understand this. Trials form a necessary discipline in our lives. A.W. Tozer said this, before God can use a person greatly, he must allow that person to be hurt deeply. I've had many conversations with people that I care about that have said, I don't understand why the Lord is doing this to me. Why is this happening to me? Why am I going through this? I don't get it. I don't understand. And I listen and I hear them out and depending on the situation, depending if they want to respond, a response, I will say that, again, God wants to use you. God wants to use your situation, your trial, your storm, the persecution you're going through. He wants to use that situation. He wants to, to in order to shape you, to mold you, so that you can be, He can use you greatly. Now, this isn't because God is mean, but because He knows we can't comfort others unless we've been comforted ourselves. See, trials not only enable us to comfort others, but they also do this, these, these five things. Trials prove the reality of our faith and weed out those who are mere professors. Trials develop certain graces, such as endurance in our character. Number three, trials make us more zealous in spreading the gospel. And five, trials help us to remove the useless junk, the useless junk from our lives. So, Knowing that, here's a good question, rhetorical question for you all. What happens? What happens when you are in a fiery trial? Well, just ask Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and they'll tell you. Jesus shows up. That's why James tells us in James chapter 1, chapter 2, to consider it a great joy, 
when we experience trials. Because Jesus shows up. So you may be thinking, yay, a trial, yay, trials. This is wonderful, this is amazing. Sounds crazy, huh? Well, not really. Because if you have this mindset in your difficult times, you will see Jesus in a way that will not only blow your mind, also warm your heart. See, here's the thing. And listen carefully. Trials, they don't make or break us. They simply reveal what's inside. When I'm driving and hit, the, hit a bump, the coffee that splash, pl- splashes out of the mug on my dashboard was there before the bump. The bump doesn't put the coffee in. It just shows what was already in the cup. So that's what trials do. I'm angry because of what he or she did to me. I'm angry and upset because of this situation that I'm now in. See, the only way a person can really know how he or she is doing is through bumping, through bumpy, discouraging, heartbreaking times. Why? Because they reveal the heart. They show what's really there. How you react to trials will show how close of a relationship you have with the Lord. If your reaction is just putting your trust, your faith, your health, your life in the Lord's hands, shows just how, much, how dependent you are on him and how much you trust him to get you out of the situation you're in or to get you through the situation you're in. But if you're always looking for a better way out or a better plan or you just give up and want nothing to do with the faith, again, it shows that you never really made an effort or you're not really making an effort to draw near to the Lord, to get to know Him better, to fall in love with Him more, to allow Him to comfort you in those difficult times. Now, in verse 5, Paul states the third reason he sent Timothy to Thessalonica reiterating once again that he could no longer stand knowing how they were knowing how they were doing he sent Timothy to find out about their faith in other words he wanted to find out if they were weathering the storm of persecution see again Paul was genuinely concerned about the condition of the believers faith he needed to know if they had succumbed to the persecution and social pressures they were experiencing, which Paul here characterizes as the means by which Satan, the tempter, tempted them. And if they were abandoning their commitment to God. Either way, whether they weren't or they were, abandoning their faith, not knowing if they had or hadn't. He just had to find out. He had to know what was going on in their lives, what was going on with that church. Now, the charge to Timothy mentioned, uh, the charge to Timothy mentioned in verse 2 indicates that Paul hoped for the best. But verse 5 reveals feared the worst. 
Now keep in mind, this doesn't mean that he feared that they had lost their salvation. No, not at all. See, back in chapter 1, verse 4, it says that he told them that this is something they could never do. They could, however, stop walking by faith, not trusting God in all the circumstances of their life. Now, if this was the case, if this is what had happened, if they had walked away from the Lord, abandoned Him, returned back to these idols and gods, then it meant that all the time, all the love, all the energy had been wasted. All the stuff that had been invested, that they had invested in that church would have been for nothing. As believers, we all, all of us, will go through life's unpleasant circumstances. But a remedy for an anxious heart is how you view those unpleasant circumstances, how you see them. See, looking at trials through just a narrow lens, it's going to cause anxiety. It's going to worry you. There are going to be concerns there. However, it's important, it's necessary to also, to not just to, to see those tough times, those situations, those tough moments, those trials, to not just see them with a narrow lens, but to also consider the wide angle perspective as well. Although we may not understand all, the, all of the broader panorama of God's plan, we can still have peace and delight that, as Romans 8.28 says, all things work together for the good of those who love God, who are called according to His purpose. Indeed, my friends, God works everything, out, works everything in agreement with the purpose of His will to bring praise to His glory. And one other thing to consider. Timothy was tasked to establish these believers and encourage or comfort them in their faith. See, folks, another remedy for an anxious heart is faith. It's faith in God that keeps our feet on the ground when the enemy attacks. And so the bottom line is, without faith, we are defeated. It says at the end of 1 John chapter 5, verse 4, this is the victory that has conquered the world, our faith. Let me read that again. This is the victory that has conquered the world, our faith. Your faith, my friends, has conquered the world. Your faith in Jesus has conquered the world. Your faith in God has conquered every single enemy. That includes your sickness. That includes any kind of trial or persecution you're going through. It includes just the, the, whatever, the, whatever the devil is trying to attack you with. Your faith has conquered the world. And so by looking at trials through a broader perspective and reminding yourself about the importance of faith, it's going to enable you to experience the joy and confidence in God as you go through your trials, as you go through your difficulties.
And so as we move on, as Paul moves on, we find out what that report was that Timothy gave to Paul. And he begins in verse 6 there. When Timothy met Paul at Corinth, and that's where their meetup was, was according to Acts chapter 18, verse 5, there he gave him the good news that things were doing pretty good at Thessalonica, that things were good. And you can tell there by what he said, it just, there was a sense of relief for Paul. According to the wording in Greek there in verse 6, it was as if Paul was hearing the good news of Jesus, the gospel, as if he was hearing it, the gospel itself. The Thessalonians had indeed successfully resisted Satan's temptations, and Timothy reported back about their faith and love. This suggests that he not only found them persevering and their confidence in God, but he was also maintained, they were also maintaining a proper standard of Christian conduct, love towards those around them. To Paul, it was evidence of the work of the Spirit and the reality, the reality of faith. If you can love others, genuinely be concerned and loving towards others while you're going through storms. It is evidence there. That is evidence of the Spirit working in and through you, and it also shows the reality of your faith. Because it's not easy, right? It's not easy to love others when we're going through a difficult time, when you're having a bad day, when you've had a fight with your spouse, when you've had a fight with your kid, when you've heard bad news and, and now you are expected to act normal and at work or at school. But your attitude, your conduct, loving others, it shows again how much the Spirit is working in you. Moreover, Timothy also reported that the Thessalonians had positive memories, good memories of Paul and his fellow missionaries and that they would welcome, definitely welcome, a return visit. It seems that they knew. They got it. They understood. There was no need to explain why Paul left so suddenly under, uh, under such suspicious circumstances. They understood. They weren't holding it against, against him. Then in verse 7, Paul indicates an immediate consequence of this good news from Thessalonica. In the midst of their own distress and affliction, Paul and his companions were encouraged. They were encouraged by the Thessalonians. In other words, the encouraged became the encouragers. The encouraged became the encouragers. Let me read the rest of what he says there from verse... Actually, back up and go to verse 7 and read from ver, all the way to verse 10 to the end of our passage. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 7. Therefore, brothers and sisters, in all our distress and affliction, we were encouraged about you through your faith. For now we live if you stand firm in the Lord. How can we thank God for you in return for all the joy we experience before our God because of you? 
as we pray very earnestly night and day to see you face to face and to complete what is lacking in your faith. The phrase in the beginning of verse 8, for now we live, reinforces Paul's sense of relief and encouragement. Now, if you also go back to chapter 2, verses 19 and 20, it helps provide the context for understanding what he means by live. What he means by that. See, it's, just, it's not just a matter of a removal of anxiety, but a rejoicing in the Thessalonians' continued faithfulness in a way that encourages Paul and also his companions, Silas and Timothy. In the last half of verse 8, where it says, if you stand firm, that is really a conditional statement. And other Bibles, it, 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 it's written as, if you continue to stand firm. This is important because this statement functions both as an affirmation, it clearly acknowledges that they are currently standing firm, and also as an implicit exhortation, if you continue. And so what are they standing firm in? Paul says, in the Lord. And so what this tells us is that they maintained their solidarity with the Lord despite the persecutions and in the face of satanic attacks. Attacks that were designed to separate them from their faith in the Lord. And so Paul's response was to write them this letter which became the first of two letters to the Thessalonian church and which also became part of God's inspired word. What this suggests is that God's word, God's word is one of the best tools for establishing new Christians in the faith. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 15, Paul writes, So then, brothers and sisters, stand firm and hold on or hold to the traditions you were taught, whether by what we said or what we wrote. When Jesus was tempted by Satan, Matthew 4 tells us that he used the word of God to defeat him. And in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 17, Paul admonished the Ephesian believers to take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, in their battle against Satan and his demonic assistants. See, church, the Bible is able to establish us because it's, because it's inspired of God. It's not simply a book of religious ideas or good moral advice. If you didn't know this, well, let me tell you, it's the very Word of God. Every single word written here is the very Word of God. It's profitable for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, for training in righteousness. It's been well said that doctrine teaches us what is right. Rebuking tells us what is not right. Correction tells us how to get it right. And teaching tells us how to stay right. This first letter, these five chapters, is saturated with Bible doctrines. Every major doctrine of our faith is touched on these brief chapters. 
there are dozens of references to God the Father and Jesus Christ, and at least four references to the Holy Spirit. In this epistle, Paul dealt with sin and salvation, the doctrine of the church, the work of the ministry, and especially the doctrine of the last things. So, Christian believer, I tell you, a remedy for an anxious heart is having a working knowledge of the Bible. This is essential for spiritual growth and stability. This is essential for growth and stability. Continue to study the Bible. Read it, study it, break it down. Get commentaries, get, you know, just get into it as much as you possibly can. If there's something you don't understand, Ask others, ask your pastor, ask other leaders. Having that working knowledge, again, it's a working knowledge, not a stagnant knowledge. You just don't, you can't just say, I've read the Bible five times and I'm good, I understand it, or a hundred times or a thousand times. No, it's a working knowledge doesn't stop. It goes on and on and on and on. None of us will ever have more knowledge than God. That is impossible. And so as is little puny creations, we can only understand the things that He allows us to understand. If you think you know, probably don't. And what you do know, I hope that it's you're passing it down and you're showing and you're teaching others. God's word is food to nourish us, light to guide us, and a weapon to defend us. The words, thus saith the Lord, is our sure foundation. One reason God has established local churches is so that believers might grow in the word and in turn help others to grow. It's not just, it's, it, there's a, it's a whole process. It's reading God's Word. It's listening to it. It's also listening to the message that's being said alongside of it. That's why we here again want you to have your Bibles and want you to open it up and read it for yourself and to listen to it. Word of God, again, is our true foundation. Now, in the last two verses of this passage, you can see that Paul has a hard time adequately expressing to God the thanks which filled Paul's heart. Let me read that, that verse again, verse 9. How can we thank God for you in return for all the joy we experience before our God because of you. His cup of joy was overflowing every time he remembered, every time he remembered them before his God. Notice though that Paul thanked God for the Thessalonians' behavior. He didn't take credit for this. He didn't take credit for their behavior. Paul acknowledged that their endurance, their ability to weather out the storm, to endure in their trials and persecution was really a tribute to the work of God 
in them. He commended the Thessalonians, but also encouraged and acknowledged the hand of God at work in their lives. And finally, in verse 10, news of the Thessalonians' perseverance didn't relieve the apostle of his desire to return to them. He didn't say, oh, good, you guys are doing well. You guys are doing fine. I don't need to go back there. I don't need to worry about you guys. No. He grew even more intense. Though they were enduring a trial of their faith, they still needed more instruction and more growth. Paul wanted to supply what was lacking in their faith. See, the Thessalonians were like young, tender plants. Their tender roots held them firm against the present storm, but they still needed to grow. They still needed to mature. Here also, this is the first explicit reference to the deficiencies of, in their spiritual condition. Deficiencies do more to immaturity and to waywardness. So as proud as he was of the Thessalonian believers, Paul knew that there were still areas in which they needed encouragement and guidance. And so we'll see later on in chapters 4 and 5 how we minister to some of those deficiencies. This verse, verse 10, gives us another glimpse into the, apostle pri into the apostle's private life. He prayed night and day, most earnestly, that God would let him see them again. Let me clarify something here. By this, he meant that he prayed by night and by day, not all night and all day. Some people will use that as a way to get you Hey, you're a Christian. The Bible says that you have to pay, pray day in and day out, all day and all night. Now, prayer is important. Prayer is one of the best things we can do during hard times and one of the best things we can do for those we care about and love. But... We shouldn't be spending all day and all night in prayer. We've got responsibilities. We've got lives to live. We've got children to raise. We've got people who depend on us. And it just, what kind of believers would we be if we just spent every single moment, every single minute, every hour of the day in prayer. People will see us as lazy and unproductive. And, and so, again, the point being that prayer, pray throughout the day. Pray throughout the night. The Lord has you, if you're awake because you can't sleep, for one reason or another, pray. If you're sitting in your car during rush hour or you're in between classes or it's a quiet time, pray. Pray when you get every single opportunity you have. Worship the Lord. Pray for that random person, that random name that comes to your mind. Sometimes, it's weird because sometimes I'll be doing, I'll be eating cereal and just in the morning and I'll, Someone's name will pop in my head that I haven't heard or seen for years and years and years and years. And I've learned that the Lord is putting that person in my mind, in my heart, for a reason. 
So I just say, I pray for them. Lord, whatever you're going through, be with them, bless them, comfort them. You can do this too with your friends, family. Think about those people that you know are really going through a hard time. Remember, the Lord hears your prayers. He wants to know. He wants to hear from you. He wants to hear your heart. Do you really care for those people? And pray for them. I originally intended to go through this entire chapter and read that last part of chapter 3 and it's Paul's prayer that he uh, prayed. But I think I, I, I'm going to save that for next week. But I, I really hope that as we went through these first 10 verses, that it really ministered to you. They really spoke to you if you're going through a hard time. And the message that came along with it showed you ways that you can alleviate those fears, those anxieties, those concerns. The Lord will be with you during the storms of life, during those difficulties. Trust in that. Believe in that. Have faith in that. He will never leave you nor abandon you. You're His precious child. He sent His Son to die for you, to forgive you of your sins, to free you from death and from sin. You've heard this message, and if you've heard this message, you're probably thinking, man, I, I have a lot of worries. I have a lot of anxieties. I have a lot of concerns. I, worry, I feel like I worry 24-7, and nothing I've done Nothing I've been a part of has alleviated those concerns or those worries. Well, have you ever considered just laying them at the Lord's feet? Just giving it to Him and allowing Him to take them from you. Well, I want to give you an opportunity to do that. I want to give you an opportunity to give Jesus a chance. Allow Him to give you a peace that surpasses all understanding will free you from those bondages if you just surrender your heart to Him. If you just surrender your heart, your mind, those areas in your life that you've held on to so tightly. Jesus died for you to forgive you. If you want to be forgiven of your sins, I want you to close your eyes and bow your head. And I want you to repeat, repeat this prayer after me. Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner and I ask you to forgive me. I believe that you died for my sins on the cross and that three days later you rose from the dead. I repent of my sins and turn away from them now and confess you and you alone as my personal Lord and Savior. Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for forgiving me and thank you for saving me. So now I ask you to fill me with the Holy Spirit so that he may help guide me in my new born-again life. In your name, amen. If you prayed that, reach out to us. I want to help you in your next steps. I want to encourage you. I want to help establish you in the faith. I hope you all have a great week. Thank you again for joining us. Please, I just ask you to share this message to others who might need to hear it. 
who might be changed by it, who are just going through a really difficult time, a storm in their life. It may definitely get them, help them get, uh, help them to hold on to the Lord, to continue to hold on to the Lord so that He will get them through it. Be a blessing this week to others. And we look forward to seeing you again next week as we continue, as we end this chapter and then continue into chapter four. Until then, we love you. Goodbye. Thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope you were blessed by Pastor Angel's message. For more information about Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, such as our service time or how to get connected, please visit our website at fvccelp.com. If the Lord is leading you to give to the ministry of Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, there's a PayPal link in the video description below. Once again, thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope to see you again soon.